we all know the planet is in crisis. Environmental campaigners, scientists are panicking. Children are learning about climate change at school, really worried about the future. But as we know, panicking gets you nowhere. I should know, I'm always the first to panic. And if we look at history, at people who had a real challenge, they found a way to figure it out. Figure it out. So what we need to do is find that way to figure it out in the 21st century right now. But first of all, we really need to understand what the problem is. I'm interested in why so many million tons of our clothing goes to landfill every year. And by 2025, there will be 8 billion people on the planet and we'll all have something in common, clothing. And in most countries, it's a legal requirement. <laughs> but our challenge is that we're running out of raw materials. We can't produce enough natural raw materials to clothe the planet. So we need to use what we already have in circulation. It's easy to feel overwhelmed and think, just one more shopping trip and I'll be okay. I'll, I'll stop then. Or to be tempted by that t-shirt for the same price as a Big Mac. And for those of us into low carbon pursuits, cycling and running, we still all have one thing in common. It will eventually wear out and we'll need to dispose of it. For this task, for this challenge, I have two points of inspiration. The first is my gran and the second is NASA. <laughs> Growing up, I spent a lot of time with my gran, and she taught me the value of community activism. She's an incredible, tiny lady. And this image is from 1950, from the day that her and her neighbors got the keys to their first council house with an inside bathroom something unimaginable today and quite relevant in a city like Bath. But they had campaigned quietly and persistently for what they believed was their right. And look how happy they are when they achieved that goal. As I said, I grew up a lot with my gran and she taught me to knit. Everybody could knit. My mum could knit. My gran could knit. Our neighbours could knit. They could knit with a cigarette in one hand, two knitting needles, telly on. It was the 70s after all. And what they did was they knitted these incredible, intricate iron jumpers, but they made them out of acrylic yarn. It was a coal mining community. They didn't have a lot of money. And as a small person, you were made to wear these jumpers, really itchy, scratchy. And just as you'd grown out of one, sighed with relief, your gran was unraveling two and knitting it into one big one. Today, we call this the circular economy. Can I just ask, do we have any knitters in the room and do you knit your winter woolen collection? One champion at the back. <laughs> Planted. Can I ask, do we have anyone who has a sewing kit in their house? They're planet champions. And do you all use this sewing kit? See, I believe we can save the planet sewing on that pop button, one button at a time. It's that simple. Just making sure we do those simple repairs and keeping that clothing in use for as long as possible and teaching others those skills. So that if someone doesn't know how to do that, if we can help them do that, it might keep that garment in use for longer. My second point of inspiration is NASA. And this year, we celebrate 50 years of Apollo 11, the moon landing, first man on the moon. I've always been excited about space travel. 
I was born in 1969, and I'm the same height as Yuri Gagarin, five foot two. <laughs> NASA named their mission to the moon, taking a moonshot. Today, when we talk about taking a moonshot, it's an ambitious, long-term project. What we don't often realize is the impact that NASA has on our daily lives. For example, our Nike Air trainers started out as space boots for astronauts, or that our laptop started out as a portable computer for astronauts. I was lucky enough to meet a real NASA astronaut, Colonel Katie Coleman. She spent 158 hours in space. And she is a scientist, a chemist, a chemical scientist. And she specializes, Katie specializes in plastics, plastic polymers. NASA rely on people like Colonel Coleman to build their spaceships, to get up to space and back down again. What we don't realize is that those same plastics same plastics in our plastic bottles, 65% of our clothing is made from that same plastic. And if we look at our clothing labels right now, most of us will be wearing something that's polyester, acrylic, nylon, that's derived from a polymer. I'm wearing 100% polyester. This is my favorite outfit. I bought it about eight years ago for a special event. I've worn it about 80 times, sometimes even to the shops. But here's the thing, polyester isn't suitable for every occasion. And to be quite frank, I'm a bit hot right now. <laughs> but it's completely recyclable. So we can, decon just like my gran in her knitting, we can deconstruct it, reuse it again and again. And this reduces the need to use new raw materials, to find new petrochemicals for clothing. We can use what we have. And we know, because 92 million tons is going to landfill, we know we have enough to make this happen. In the Apollo 13 mission, Tom Hanks, in the Hollywood version, says, Houston, we have a problem. In real life, Captain James Lovell said, Houston, we have had a problem. This is not just a difference in semantics, but in attitude. The astronauts recognized they had a problem. They contacted mission control, they sorted it out, they got back to Earth safely. So safely that when they got to the press call, this life-threatening incident wasn't even mentioned. I believe this level of calm and skill is what we need to save our planet. Bath has an incredible resource. It's called the Fashion Museum. I would say that, I studied fashion. But here we have a beautiful example of a Dior dress from 1950, the day that my gran received the keys to her first house with an inside bathroom. Second, we have this beautiful crocheted garment from 1969 when we landed on the moon. It's made of polyester acrylic. But what are we doing right now and what does the future look like? I was invited to talk to the students at Imperial College, the design engineering students, the astronauts of the future. And they asked me to talk to them about fashion and fashion waste. And a few months later, they invited me back to talk about their, what they had done. And then they showed me what they'd done, and it looked like something straight out of science fiction. They showed me examples where they had taken live cultures, impregnated them into fabric samples, and built microbial textiles in the lab real living textiles designed and made in a lab. And this is their prototype, a kind of mocked up example made from real lichen. I think we can agree 
the orange one. It's not quite runway ready yet. <laughs> and in fact, we don't want our engineers to design fashion. We want our fashion designers to design fashion, but we want our engineers to help them find those sustainable solutions. And I found that really inspiring, and it gave me hope for the future. I'd like to finish with one last image from NASA. This is Earthrise from the 1968 Apollo 8 space mission. Captain Bill Anders said, when they looked back from the moon, they didn't realize what they were looking at. It was something so small and delicate. And then they realized this magnificent small ball was Earth, a small magnificent ball in the vastness of space. But something so small and delicate needs our help. So I'd like to ask you to think about the planet as if you're seeing it for the first time with beauty and wonder. And secondly, to address it with the pragmatism and skill of astronauts. So let's take that moonshot for the planet and one step for humankind. Thank you. <laughs>